So we're going to break up this uh, session into sort of three three different parts, really. Which the first is an overview of what uh, we mean by a data safe haven, and particularly our implementation of one. Um, and then we're going to walk you through a bit of uh, hopefully a live demo of of what this looks like in practice. Uh, and then we'll finish up um, with the opportunity for sort of community discussion and any questions that might come up. So. Um, Basically, the, uh, I'm going to start by talking about the challenge uh, that we're trying to solve and uh, the approach that we've uh, taken to this. So um, one problem that comes up quite often when you're dealing with sensitive data is trying to agree what the data sensitivity is and what the security controls that uh, should be wrapped around that data are. Um, so our approach is to come up with a series of sort of tiers of sensitivity. Uh, we have five different tiers and each of those has some recommended security controls. And that just gives you sort of like out of the box um, subdivision that we can put uh, a project into one of those categories. Um, the next thing that often um, comes up is to do with um, deploying and, uh, and running um, some sort of safe, uh, safe haven environment that you can uh, look at sensitive data in. Um, and of course, then the idea is that you want to be sure that there's um, security around um, this, uh, this environment. And the way that we try to ensure that is by having an open source um, implementation of a software defined safe haven that runs on Azure. So the idea there is that um, it can be, the, the, the code that deploys one of these things can be audited um, and uh, like the uh, anyone's able to deploy one themselves uh, and make changes to it as and when they think that's necessary. Um, we also, on top of the um, tiered uh, sensitivity that we just I discussed earlier, um, we're able to tune the controls uh, around uh, the data to match the data sensitivity of the project. So um, we add in independent per project secure research environments where that's necessary. Um, and then, of course, finally, the most important thing is providing a research environment that's actually possible for people to be productive in. Um, and so we developed a batteries included uh, data science virtual machine, which has R and Python, Julia, Scala, um, and a load of pre-installed packages. And then on top of that, um, we have package mirrors for PyPy and CRAN included. So people are able to install their own um, additional software on top of that. Um, so I mentioned the uh, different classifications, uh, the different sensitivity tiers. Um, and our classification process basically is a classification of uh, what we call a work package, which is a combination of the, the data set that you're, you're working with, but also the type of analysis that you want to perform on it. Um, so we classify each work package into one of five sensitivity tiers. Um, and we have several different roles uh, that uh, take part in the classification. So firstly, someone who's uh, from the organization providing the data. So that's the data set provider representative. Um, then we have the investigator. So that's the person leading the research project um, who's going to be responsible for using the data in this project. Uh, and then finally, uh, we have a referee, which is an independent advisor um, with some expertise in handling sensitive data um, who's there um, uh, to make sure that uh, the, the the first two uh, people come to agreement about uh, what the appropriate level of sensitivity uh, and associated controls for this data set is going to be. So the, the different tiers that we have uh, range upwards from uh, tier zero to tier four. Um, so what we call uh, tier zero is publicly available open data sets um, or data that's intended for immediate publication. And this is the, the most open uh, of our sensitivity classification. And then at tier one, um, we have something slightly more restricted. So this could be data that is intended for eventual publication, um, but maybe the people working on it are worried they'd be scooped if, it, uh, if the data was leaked. Um, also, uh, pseudonymized uh, or synthetic personal data where there's no chance of de-identification could fall into this category, uh, or commercially sensitive data, but where the consequences of disclosing the data are, are so low that they'd be trivial. Um, then at tier two, we have, um, again, pseudonymized or synthetic personal data where we, we, we have good you know, confidence, strong confidence that the um, data can't be de-identified, but it's not absolute confidence. Um, or again, commercially sensitive data or legally sensitive data where there is some risk, but it's low risk uh, from uh, disclosing it. Then moving up again, um, tier three would have um, most uh, non-pseudonymized personal data or pseudonymized data where the uh, quality is weak. Um, 
or commercial or government data that is um, likely to be subject to attack. And then uh, tier four, we have personal data where disclosing the data would be a severe, substantial threat to personal safety or security, and which you know uh, sophisticated uh, actors, so like nation states, might be interested in trying to compromise this data. So what do our controls look like in these different categories? Um, so um, basically, uh, we think in the, the, the lowest tiers, tier zero and one, you, you don't need to use something like this um, safe haven. For tiers two and three, um, we've run uh, projects in both of these tiers uh, using our safe haven implementation. And tier four is something where we don't really have the confidence that we're able to implement the types of things that we'd like to, uh, to require to be able to support that. So in tier zero and one, then um, you know this is open to the internet, uh, inbound and outbound. You can use whatever devices you want. You can connect over remote desktop or SSH. Um, you can copy and paste in and out of the environment and, and so on. Um, it's, a, it's a very open environment. Um, tier two, um, then the, the main changes are that you can only connect from certain uh, known institutional networks. Um, you can't connect uh, outwards to the internet. You're only able to connect over remote desktop through a secured um, web platform. You can't copy and paste in and out of the environment. Um, you require a, a referee to sign off on any uh, on the data classification, uh, and we institute some uh, security controls around bringing data into and out of the environment. Then moving up into tier three, um, we further restrict the the, the networks that you're able to uh, access from. We require that all user devices and managed devices where you don't have admin access on them. Um, we try to require some level of uh, physical security, although obviously in the current uh, state with uh, everyone working from home, that's a bit more difficult to do. Um, and then uh, as far as the uh, package mirrors go, then we have a white list of acceptable uh, pre-approved packages rather than the full list of everything that's available on CRAN or PyPy. And then going through to tier four, then we really require a lot more sort of physical security um, and a much stronger whitelist on top of uh, uh, what was already applied in tier three. So what does our implementation look like? So our reference implementation is on Microsoft Azure. Um, and so for each uh, project, uh, for each work package, we'd have, uh, we'd spin up a secure research environment. So this is a deployment from a source controlled uh, configuration file. Um, it's almost uh, completely automated. It still needs a little bit of uh, human in the loop here, but but mostly it's completely scripted. Um, and there are some default security controls, but you can customize them um, if you need to. And then several different secure research environments can share a single safe haven management. Um, so this is what controls the user creation and um, credentials uh, and uh, multi-factor authentication for those users. Uh, and it's also where the, the package mirrors live. Um, so we have one set of, for each of those categories for one, so one set of tier two mirrors, one set of tier three, uh, and so on. Um, there's also a web application to support the data classification. So this walks the, the data provider representative and the, um, uh, the investigator through the, the classification process that will take their work package and decide what uh, category it falls into. Um, and that's also needed every time you want to bring data into or out of the environment. Um, and then finally, I mentioned before the uh, the batteries included Linux VM. So this has you know R and R Studio, different versions of Python, different editors, Postgres database, various things that we think you know would be useful to people. Uh, and we're also very uh, happy to to add new things to that uh, as and when people say that they want them. Uh, the running costs uh, at the moment are around about four hundred pounds uh, a month for the for the management. And then for each of these secure research environments is somewhere between 650 and 950. Uh, and then depending on which of these package mirror options you need, um, there's an additional cost for that. And it takes around, uh, probably you've cut this down a little bit, so maybe it's about two hours to deploy the management now and about two and a half to uh, deploy each uh, secure research environment. Uh, most of which is, is you don't need to actually be sort of there the whole time, you should just leave a script running. Um, so, this is sort of developed over time um, to support uh, a regular kind of hack week that we run at the Turing called the Data Study Group. So um, between uh, April 2017 and 18, we had sort of six completely independent, manually set up secure research environments, um, which were reused for each uh, set of these data study groups. Um, 
for December 2018, um, then we introduced this shared management environment um, and the batteries included data science VM. Uh, for April, we then had automated the secure research environment deployment and added in the package mirrors. Um, by August in 2019, then we'd almost completely automated the, uh, the research environment and the management. Uh, and we had an independent test that these could be deployed by people who weren't directly involved in the project. Um, and then by December last year, then we improved some automation, um, deployed a complete new management from scratch, and we started using the web app for data classification. Um, and then what we were planning, what we were planning to do in April, um, but that's now been uh, delayed uh, till the next time we're able to run one of these, um, is to uh, completely automate this and make it uh, more easily deployable by other organisations, uh, and start using these for long-running projects rather than just these short-term hack weeks. So the basic sort of uh, layout of what the, the schematic of what the environment looks like is uh, is here, and this is probably a little bit confusing. So I'm going to go into this individual bits in a bit more detail. Uh, so what we have here is so one, one of these secure research environments for each project. Um, and what that looks like is um, there's, there's sort of uh, one way into it to, uh, to bring the data in, which is done by sysadmins. There's another way in, which is what the users use. Um, so they log into a, a web-based remote desktop, which then gives them access to some uh, of our batteries included uh, virtual machines. Uh, and also access to some shared services. So uh, we have GitLab for version control and HackMD for collaborative report writing. Um, so each project has its own sort of controls over uh, which users can access it. And um, that's controlled both by obviously username and password, but also with multi-factor authentication, um, which is run uh, centrally. So the, the user uh, controls are all part of the, the management layer. Um, and then the... Uh, we also have the mirrors live in the management layer and each of the secure research environments is connected to one set of these mirrors, so either to the tier two ones or the tier three ones, where if the project has some specific requirements, then we can have per project uh, whitelisted mirrors. Um, the, bringing the data into the environment, um, so we, uh, we go through the, the classification process with the data provider representative and the investigator and the referee, um, and then we have a sysadmin bring the data in through um, uh, secure uh, file copying method uh, onto the data server um, and then it's available from inside the environment. So uh, our next steps are going to be to improve the uh, automation and documentation of this environment and we want to try and share this kind of version 1.0 um, as a community open source project. So we really really want um, contributions from the community um, both around ideas about how to improve this and also um, just uh, people to, to start using it um, if it's useful to them. Um, we want to try and get uh, certification. So firstly, this um, ISO 27001 certification, and also um, there's an NHS certification to be allowed to use um, to work with NHS data. Um, another thing that we'd like to focus on is the cost. So you might have seen from that uh, network schematic, we have quite a lot of different virtual machines that are needed as part of setting up this uh, secure research environment. Um, so we'd like to reduce that number. Uh, we'd like to be able to delegate some permissions down to the people who actually are doing the research to let them maybe manage the, the virtual machine they're using, scale it up and down, um, turn it on and off, that type of thing. Um, and at the moment, this is only based on Azure, and we'd like to support a wider range of clouds than, than just Azure. Um, and also to be able to delegate uh, some of the management stuff uh, to, to the uh, web app, which at the moment we only use for data classification. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up the uh, this sort of slide intro by talking about the team. So we've had quite a, uh, a big team of people, like a lot of people at the Turing Institute who've contributed either through uh, thoughts about the policy side of things or in terms of uh, contributing to the actual code base. We've also worked with some contractors uh, who are experts in different bits of uh, network, like Windows networking or um, Azure itself. Um, and uh, we've had a, a, lo a lot of help also from... Um, from people who've, who've helped out with the legal side of things. Um, so yeah, thank you to all of these people. Um, and so with that, I'm gonna move on to uh, uh, Jules, who's gonna talk a bit about the uh, data classification. Hi there, okay, let me share my screen. Uh, can you see that okay? 
Yep, cool. So my name's Jules Manser. I'm the project manager for the uh, Turing's data study group uh, hack hackathons, I guess. Um, so I've been working with um, James and the team uh, helping sort of develop some of the ideas and how this works in practice uh, over the last few years as we've been sort of the main use case um, of the safe haven and how this all works. So one of the sort of first steps uh, when thinking about uh, using the safe haven is to, as James was talking about, was to classify the project or the work package. Um, so I'm going to take you through the web app um, and uh, show you a little bit about how we classify uh, the project, the, the work packages. So here we have the um, web app so I'm currently logged in as a program manager so generally I can set up projects and prepare them for uh, the classification stages. I also can sort of uh, add users um, and uh, manage that a little bit as well. Um, so in terms of projects, um, if I just go to add a project you can just some basic information is all that's sort of needed to begin with and um, when you sort of create that let me just cancel that and go to my uh, prepared version um, you're sort of presented with uh, what well, this looks quite complicated but is relatively straightforward so I have the participants so generally speaking I just need to record who are the sort of uh, important people looking after the data. So the data provider representative, uh, the investigator, the referee. I have down here, so we need to associate the data, data sets with the project. They don't come automatically with the data sets. Uh, and you can have one, you can have multiple data sets. And as these can relate to the actual work packages. So in some cases, usually for ingress, for example, you'll have lots of data sets that you need for the project. Whereas maybe for egress, you won't be needing to remove all of those data sets uh, out again. So just with ingress, uh, I will show you. So at this moment uh, for this little uh, project we've created, um, as the program manager, I'm looking after making sure that the classification is done so I can then instruct uh, the research engineering group as to what kind of uh, safe haven we need for this project. Um, so Tom, who I've uh, got as the investigator and James, who is the data provider representative have completed their, um, their assessments, but um, if I click on view classification, I can see, uh, okay, so what they've done is they've gone through the classification and both of them have come to a sort of tier three agreement. Now, um, what that means is that with any uh, sort of project that is going to be tier two or above, it usually needs a referee. So I'm just going to jump back a bit and I'm going to, uh, designate myself as the referee. Now, normally I wouldn't be doing this, but for the purposes of this demo, um, we can. So add participant. Usually uh, all of the relevant participants will be uh, stored in uh, the uh, web app. Uh, at that moment, it's just a few of us. And I'm going to be uh, the referee on the ingress for this example. So just add myself. Okay, so I'm now the referee, um, and now I shall be able to classify and finish this uh, assessment. Okay, so I no longer can see uh, what the other people have um, classified it. So with the uh, investigator, the data provider representative and the referee, they cannot see what each other have uh, classified it because this classification should be done independently of one another. Um, if in, and in some cases, uh, they do come to uh, disagreements, they, they don't classify it as the same, uh, what happens then is that a conversation needs to happen uh, between the investigator, the data provider representative and the referee to come to a consensus as to which um, 
classification tiers by using the questions uh, which are provided as part of the uh, classification. So you'll see a few of them. I'm going to now complete this uh, classification. So So basically, quite simply, it just throws you a bunch of yes and no questions. And all you need to do is just answer yes or no, depending on what you think the data is. As the referee, now hopefully, uh, are you able to see this screen? Mm -hmm. Yep, cool. So this is actually a uh, from from within the safe haven, the demo, the demo safe haven. So as the referee, as with the uh, the investigator, you need to have a look and see what the data is. Now, ordinarily, obviously, you're not going to screen share this kind of information because hmm, I'm looking here and I've got people's names. And interestingly enough, I've got people's postcodes. That could be a bit personal and sensitive. So yes, obviously, in, in real life, you wouldn't be sharing this across uh, uh, screens and so forth. But for, the, for, for, for doing this, the referee and all the others need to sort of have a look and see what kind of data uh, is in the package. And James will uh, go over a little bit more about looking at the actual safe haven a bit later. So I've looked at the uh, data and I'm now thinking about what these questions are. So uh, will the research generate any personal data? So um, with the description of from before of the project, which I think was looking at uh, kettles uh, boiling temperatures and different hardnesses of water, will it generate uh, personal data? No, I don't think it will. Cool. Will any project input be personal data? Now, for some strange reason, the data set they sent me um, seemed to have people's names and postcodes. So yeah, that does, for some reason, uh, does include uh, personal data. So yes. So is that personal data legally accessible by the general public with no restrictions on use? Um, so probably not. We think maybe, and again, this is where a lot of conversations need to happen between the uh, investigator and the, um, uh, the data representative and with the referee included to sort of sometimes get a better clearer idea of what uh, these kinds of things mean. But generally, um, we think that maybe the uh, participants signed up uh, voluntarily. Um, so do I think it's legally accessible by the general public? Probably not because it's from the company itself and they've collected that uh, information. So, no. Is that personal data pseudo-anonymized? Definitely not. And finally, would disclosure pose a substantial threat to the personal safety, health or security of the data subjects? Well, it has got personal data, but we are talking about kettles boiling water. So I don't think it would uh, pose a substantial threat to the personal safety of those users. So I'm going to classify it as no. So that classifies it. So that's gone through the whole thing and that's classified that as a tier three. And luckily, of course, for the demo, we've made sure all of our answers align. Uh, it's outputted a tier three um, result. So I would be instructing uh, the uh, IT people to prepare a tier three environment. Um, yes, I think that's it. And James is now gonna show you more about how the uh, safe haven actually looks like on the inside. Great. Yeah, so um, let me try and share my screen again. Um, can you see a web browser? Great. OK, um, so yeah, so we have this. Uh, this is the URL uh, for the safe haven for this demo. So. Um, it's you know, it's got uh, CW20 as part of the URL because it was set up for this um, uh, for today, and then um, it's a, a sandbox environment which uh, has uh, this this kettle data set uh, already uh, added to it. So um, uh, at this stage, um, you, what you need to log in is just your username and password, 
um, which I've already set up. So I can just sign in here. Um, and now I can see a sort of uh, dashboard uh, with the different things that I can use. So this is the, the main data science machine, um, which I connect to over remote desktop. If I really wanted to, I could connect over SSH. If we deployed some other machines, you could connect to them here. Um, and if you want to have a look at um, the GitLab and HackMD for uh, collaborative working, um, we could do that here. So when we click on one of these things, um, it should actually give me a, um, a multi-factor authentication prompt on my phone. So I, you can't see this, um, but I'm having to, in, to approve a notification on my phone um, to be allowed to, uh, to go any further with this. And if I don't do that, then it won't let me in. So here you can see this is a, um, a GitLab instance um, and I can log into it and um, not actually be able to log in. Interesting. Um, <laughs> so uh, I was going to show you on GitLab, there's uh, some code there already, but um, I can show you it on the uh, remote desktop instead. So this is what the, the remote desktop looks like running inside your browser. Um, and we can have a look at what's uh, available um, as far as the data goes. So um, if we just look at the file system, um, we've got this uh, kettle boiling data. And then here we can see uh, these are exactly the, the files that Jules opened before. So the kettle data, um, which has um, people's uh, names and postcodes and the type of kettle they're using and um, the, the amount of time it took to boil. And then we also have um, some data about water hardness, um, which tells us on some arbitrary scale um, for each postal district, you know, what is the, the water hardness in that district? Um, so that's our input data. Um, and so this uh, this is a, um, a piece of code that I uh, added to the uh, the GitLab earlier, um, and it just runs a little um, analysis of this uh, data. So we can hopefully, um, if I open up a text editor, we can have a look at what the code does. It's very very simple. It's probably not. Um, the thing you would um, uh, want to do if you were uh, doing this project a bit more seriously, but it's a very, very quick sort of initial look uh, at the data. So uh, what we do is we we open these um, CSV files. Um, we take, we construct the sort of the postal district uh, field using the, the postcode. So that's just the first part of the postcode. So that's easy to do. Then we merge these two data sets together um, and then we make a plot of the, the boiling time uh, and the water hardness. Um, so let me just run this and I'll be able to make these plots. Hang on, let me just change environment. So I think I need to be in Python 3.6 for this. Yeah, so, um, so you can see here, this is the, uh, this is the data about uh, the kettles joined on to the water hardness. Um, and here we can see um, yeah, just these very basic things. So firstly, have a look at how the sort of type of kettle um, affects uh, what the uh, what the boiling time is, we can see you know there's some distribution of different boiling times for different kettles. There's some distribution of water hardness for different kettles. It looks like the different kettles do have some different inherent boiling time, and then there's some effect from water hardness on top of that. So if we want to disentangle these two, maybe what we want to do is sort of work out the average boiling time for each kettle type to track that off. Um, so then um, if we do that. Um, we can see here, so this is kettle boiling time versus water hardness. Um, you can see here, like 
different types of cats also definitely showing um, sort of distinct differences. And if you subtract off the average time, then you can do like, you know, a simple linear fit and see how that looks. Um, and we can see, yes, there is some sort of linear correlation um, between boiling time and water hardness um, if you do this very naive analysis. Um, so all of that we could do, you know, inside this safe haven, this is running um, in a web browser, um, but the actual back end to this is all running on this virtual machine in, uh, in SEO. So I think that's um, the main part of what we wanted to demo really. Um, and I think like what, we, what we'd like to get out of this session is um, uh, the discussion really. So we'd like to know like what are your thoughts about this as an environment, like what could we do to make it better or um, you know, what are we doing well or badly basically. So um, I think probably like to open it to uh, questions from the floor now. I think Beck um, has raised her hands. Yeah. Um, so I was just going to ask about um, whether you've got a feel for uh, the groups that are using uh, this, whether they're kind of using it for data that um, is being, I guess, analysed in isolation, or whether there's any appetite for um, sort of uh, federated analysis or meta-analysis to be done with, for example, uh, people having one of these at different locations and stuff. Um, what do you think, Jules? Um, so at the moment, our main use case is the data study group. So uh, for, for that activity, we basically have, um, say, about 50 participants all come down to the Turing Institute. Uh, and basically, everybody's got their own uh, cred login credentials. Uh, each uh group because it's like a little it's like a hackathon uh but we have say six up to six different challenges so each different challenge has its own environment and they're basically working collaboratively um together in that uh sort of state um and for the data study group we've basically had uh, all kinds of challenges from tier zero to tier three um and obviously uh in that sort of situation, we can control quite a lot in terms of everybody's coming through the same uh, network uh, um, from within the institution. Um, now, I guess one of the big challenges, especially in this day and age uh, at this moment is uh, that question. And I think it's still something that we're looking into very much so that it's a for, for, for projects which are going to be tier two and above, and I'm going to discount tier four, uh, there, where there's very much going to be a conversation needed to be had with the data provider um, in terms of how much they, how comfortable they are in terms of uh, giving people access uh, to this to this environment, being able to access their data but from home. Um, I think if I could add something about the, the question yeah. about federated uh, use. So, I mean, these environments are designed deliberately to be like isolated from one another. So I think like you certainly could imagine different people looking at the same or similar data, but I think it'd be difficult to combine work from people working in, in different places um, without going through this, uh, this egress procedure, which we kind of, uh, glossed over but basically it's sort of the reverse of the ingress procedure where you have to get approval um, from the data provider representative and the um, the the PI of the project um, to be able to take any data back out of this um, so in that sense I guess we're like we're more set up for self-contained projects um, there's nothing inherently meaning that you couldn't you know come up with a way to to have different different groups working together and then perhaps combining their results somewhere, perhaps in another safe haven. Um, but it's not something we've had to deal with yet. So I, the reason why I asked is because, I mean, obviously, I think you're probably deploying these just in the UK, I'm guessing. Um, well, that's who perhaps you're speaking to. So I, I, just from our work with um, sort of other countries in Europe, some of them 
actually legislate to say that personal data is not allowed to leave their country. And so uh, if you're a researcher that um, wants to uh, analyze in a federated way as part of a meta-analysis, then um, I guess the norm has been traditionally that you'd apply to each of these people and you have to get pre-approval from every single you know, data owner that you, you, um, you, you need to get the authority to use that data with. And then you have to like upload your analysis scripts to every single environment, run your analysis at every single location in isolation, and then use statistical techniques on the results once they're given back to you to combine them so that they're meaningful. Um, so the reason why I raise this is because this is the exact problem that Data Shield um, has solved. And so um, uh, I was just wondering if, if, I mean, the thing is, it depends who your users are and sort of who you, uh, the community that you imagine using. Uh, this sort of environment and the types of data they have and the analysis requirements they have but um, that's basically why we we built that piece of software to do that whilst as I said maintaining the privacy um, yeah so I mean that's a, that's a very interesting use case I think like this isn't inherently restricted to the UK because it's cloud-based you can pick you know which um, data center you're going to deploy to and Microsoft have maybe not a data center in every single country, but for a lot of countries, you could, you know, guarantee that all of the infrastructure was going to be uh, running in that country. Um, and you certainly would be able to to spin up, you know, you could imagine spinning up 10 of these, each one running a different country and then running the same thing on each one um, and then combining the outputs. But it's not sort of inherently built in, you know, we, that isn't like, that isn't the use case that we've looked for is to say, to say, here's how to run the same thing in 10 different places. We've we tended to think that each research environment would be separate. So although you could combine them, we've not built it with the idea that you should combine them sort of from the beginning. Okay, thanks. I just wanted to say there's some questions in the notes document as well, if you would want to take a look through. James, I think you're muted. Sorry, yep. Um, let me just stop sharing. Um, try and find the notes. Okay. Um, There's a link to them in the chat. If... Yeah, now I can see these now. Um, should we could just go through them in the order they are here? Sounds good. Okay, right. So, boiling times of a kettle by, would not by most people be considered personal information. Um, yeah, so, I mean, we deliberately sort of included this uh, postcode information and name information so there would be some personal data in there. Um, if it was just the boiling times, it's very hard to think of a way in which just knowing the boiling time of a kettle would tell you something about the person. I mean, maybe whoever posed this question can think of a way it could. I mean, I personally can't. Uh, sorry, Carlos here. Um, yeah, that was my question. Maybe the, the boiling time is not a good example, but I'm, I was thinking more of, um, for instance, the kettle model. Uh, maybe most people would say, oh, well, that's not important. That's open. Uh, but maybe I just happen to have a kettle that is a very specific model, and I'm the only person in the whole country that has this particular kettle. So uh, my, my question is whether there's a risk that you say, oh, this is not personal data, but for some corner cases, it might be, and you have any way of saying, oh, actually, we should elevate this from being tier three to being tier four, or because- Yeah, and I think that's, that's a good example of something um, that we didn't really touch on, which is um, you could imagine two data sets that don't look like they're particularly um, sensitive in themselves, or but you could construct something that was more sensitive from them. So you could imagine, for instance, if you had um, something about um, uh, the, the, the brand of kettle owned and the name of the person, and you um, separately had, sorry, the brand of the kettle owned and like the postcode, and you separately had something about um, the brand of the kettle owned and uh, the, the name of the person, you could combine those to get, you know, a, a map of, of person to postcode and if the, you were the only person with some particular brand it would be you, you know you'd be uniquely identifiable in that data set so we definitely consider the case where combining data sets can end up with something that'd be a higher tier than either data set would be on their own um but it's i mean i think all of these things come down to uh 
at some level, uh, you know, it's sort of personal judgment on the part of the data provider representative and the uh, the PI of the project, as well as the referee. Um, um, I guess we hope that the the data provider knows something about you know possible like possible avenues of uh, you know poss possible avenues of problematic data breaches. I guess in the data they're providing, and we hope that the PI um, has an idea of you know what things they're trying to get out of the data and um, what things they think might be exploitable inside the data. Um, okay. Okay, is is that a good enough answer to your question? Or do you want me to carry on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was just interested to know if this yeah. is something you have considered, but yeah, okay. Okay, um, something about version control. Um, yeah, so so we the the GitLab um, that I used, which um, Jules just told me on Slack that the reason I couldn't log in was because I gave my full uh, domain qualified name, and I should have just given the username without the domain. Um, that that GitLab instance just lives inside the environment, um, so from inside that environment you can see the GitLab, you can see the HackMD, but you can't see the internet and neither of those things can see the internet either. So it's completely isolated um, uh, instance of GitLab. Uh, so you can you can export the code later through the through the egress procedure and you can import it through the egress procedure. And it's a little that's I mean that's something we'd like to improve. It's a little bit painful at the moment to it's easy to say we're going to import uh, a zip file full of code and we're going to we're going to initialize a repo from that it's very hard to export a git repo and keep the history because you need to be able to audit every part of the history and check that no one for instance like checked in one of the data files and then later deleted it but if you exported the whole git uh, history that the data would be in there so it's something that we'd like to have a better idea of like how we how we could do that and if people have any ideas about you know nice ways to to import or export git repos in a way that you can actually like audit them as a human that would be really nice um sorry there was a couple of people asked that question so is is that enough for those people or would you like a bit more okay i guess we'll move on um so the next question was, have you got any data owners who say this is nice, but doesn't meet our particular requirement, which you think is needed? So I think we have a couple of times. And Jules, do you want to talk a bit about that? Um, I'm just trying to think. So I was thinking there was that there were those people who wanted some really specific proprietary thing, right? That you said no to. Uh, I can't remember. <laughs> but I mean, certainly, I guess from our perspective at the Turing, it's ma been mainly um for the researchers um and making sure that the researchers have got something to be able to use it there have been cases i guess when we've been discussing with the data owners as in it's usually ends up with discussion more in terms of what are the security features and how how that's all sort of stuck together um but someone, you someone's just made a note there per record logging and another example i could think of is uh, we were asked by someone if we could log every keystroke that someone made inside the environment and we said no. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess, yeah, we've had those discussions with uh, data data providers and usually usually once we've gone through quite um, a sort of a more in-depth discussion of what the security features are and basically like, for example, talking about the fact that you can't copy and paste uh, in and out of the safe haven. The safe haven doesn't have any internet connectivity. I think also, and possibly we didn't mention before, that um, when we do uh, use the safe haven, especially for the data study groups, for example, um, it is also combined with a contract, a terms and conditions that the users have to sign. So whilst the safe haven is built to try and ensure that people don't accidentally um, leak the data or lose the data and send it out into the big wide world uh, we do require all of the sort of participants for the data study group and also uh, usually uh, researchers who are going to be using it will be this will be part of their employment uh, um, agreements that they're not going to be on purpose trying to take the data out um, so usually with that kind of discussion uh, most of the data providers have been happy uh, when they do ask for sort of additional sort of software i think i know we've had in the past people asking for what's it called math lab but i think that's more of a licensing issue uh usually <laughs> yeah 
Um, I, I'm aware we've only got a few minutes left, so I'm going to try and rush through some of these later questions. Um, so, any plans to support an audited Docker image registry? That's very interesting. I mean, we thought about um, adding sort of mirrors for other um, for other packages. I mean, at the moment, we actually don't support Docker inside the environment because you can exploit being a member of the Docker user group to get root access. Um, now, in principle, we, for, especially for, for lower tiers, we're, we're in principle comfortable with some members of the team having sudo access anyway. So, um, so maybe that's something we should come back to, especially for lower tiers. Um, yeah, uh, that's that's basically the reason we haven't gone any further down anything to do with with Docker. Um, next question was about how can you sanity check incoming code. Um, so the answer for for tier two is basically we accept anything that's on uh, PyPy and CRAN as being um, uh, something that will allow people to install for themselves at tier two. At tier three, then we say um, it's only the specific set of packages that uh, will let you install. And if you have if you want to install something else. Um, then we can consider it on a case by case basis where we you know we go through the normal review process and say um, should we should we allow this in and the same is true if people want specific software packages um, during uh, during the the running time of the environment um, there's a question below saying is it open source so it's it's licensed under an MIT license the repo is not open at the moment um, and so part of the reason for that is um, there's a question by uh, Becca Wilson saying um, something about analysis logs and we're working on improving our logging and getting that to a point that we think we're comfortable that everything that's going on in the environment that's relevant would be logged in one place. Um, we're also looking at a couple of other improvements to do with um, being able to pull in updates to these servers. Uh, and we basically wanted to get to a sort of like a version 1.0 before we opened the repo. Um, but I mean, if people, if anyone here is particularly interested in collaborating, um, then please get in touch and we'd be happy to consider like giving sort of preview access to the repo um, uh, earlier than we, we actually open it up completely. Um, how are you quantifying uh, re-identification risk? Um, I, I think all of these things to do with uh, data classification, we rely on, um, the decision made by the data provider representative and the, and the PI of the project. Um, so basically, uh, you know, we've come up with these these five categories, and we're asking people to say, you know, where where do you you know what sort of security controls do you think your project's going to need based on the things that you're going to do? And maybe not everything fits perfectly into into these five categories. And so we could imagine cases where people would say, well, it's basically a tier two, but we actually want this additional control on top of that. Um, it's yeah. It's I think the security tiers are basically a, a nice way to um, to say you know the vast majority of projects are going to fall into one of these buckets, but we you know we're not forcing everything to be exactly in there. And um, if people feel that that re-identification is a particular problem, um, maybe the the tier needs to be, you know, the security needs to be higher than we would think would be true for that tier. And I know, for instance, that um, with the NHS data, they use a slightly different uh, system for categorizing uh, risk where it's based on the number of records. So, um, uh, so sort of essentially regardless of what's in the data, you know, if you only have a small number of records, the you only need sort of light security controls, whereas if you had a million records, um, you would need much stronger controls. So we don't use that system, but you could imagine that someone coming from the NHS um, who was used to that might prefer uh, a different uh, security stance than the one that we were taking. Um, does Solution use any bespoke Azure requirements? So one thing that we've been looking at is trying to, to use more X as a service. So things like you know database as a service, um, uh, Azure Firewall, stuff like that. And in general, these don't increase cost. They actually, sorry, they don't reduce cost. They actually increase costs. Um, but you, on the flip side of that, you get um, sort of more uh, confidence in the in the fact that, that the thing you're deploying is security hardened and um, 
probably less exploitable than the thing that you would deploy yourself. Um, the well, problem at the moment in Azure right. with, sorry, is, it, is that someone saying? Sorry, I was just going to say, if you just want to finish the answer to this question, then the session we need to close. because yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, if there's any other questions, if you want, if you're able to, as facilitators, answer them in the document. Yeah, I'll try and answer things in the chat here then. Um, yeah, so, so basically with um, Exit Service stuff, it's difficult to lock it down so that it's, it's sort of locked down both ways, only um, that only the machines inside the environment can access the database, but also um, that those machines can access that database, but no other databases. So that sort of two-way lockdown is quite difficult. Okay. Um, well, thank you to James and to Jules for very engaging um, and uh, excellent um, workshop. So thank you.